Well, uh, we're at the very end of our series on uh, Journey to the Cross, and uh, our texts today are going to be in Ma- uh, going to be Mark chapter 11 and 15. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, every gospel has this story of the triumphal entry in it, uh, but we're going to be focusing on specifically on Mark because they each kind of tell it just a little bit different. And this is not just because they forgot some details or they didn't have the full story. It's because each author in the New Testament, specifically in these Gospels, they're trying to do something with the story that they are telling. So, so today we're going to be call, uh, talking straight through Mark, and you'll find it's a little different than some of the other Gospels. Um, today, uh, worldwide, marks the beginning of what a lot of the world calls Holy Week. And so for the next several days, a lot of people in our culture are going to be asking some very serious questions. They're going to be asking if this whole story of Jesus really matters. They're going to be asking themselves if this is really still relevant to their life. They're going to be asking the stories about all the stories if if it were still has anything to do with them, if it still matters at all. Let's kid it. I wanted to begin this week with a look at the triumphal entry with all of its pomp and circumstance and how that entrance would lead Jesus to the cross just a few short days later. It's a difficult story to tell, and I would love it if I had a whole lot of funny jokes today to talk, but I I don't. This is a serious subject, as is the gospel always. But this story today, I think, I I hope that by the end of it, you know full well why Jesus completed his journey to the cross. Let's pray, and we will begin. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for you. And Lord, I know we all come here from different points in our life and in our faith. I know some of us may be intimidated because we don't feel like we, sh- we are as faithful as we should be or we don't know as much as we should. Lord, help us just to put that to the side for now. Or there are other people who are coming in here really confident about their value in the Christian world. And I pray that you would help us to put aside our pride for a moment. Lord, there are those of us who are, who are in this room who may be at the very end of our rope. Maybe just a, a breath away from choosing poorly. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to just sit this morning and hear what it is you have to tell us. Lord, thank you for surprising us continually, for making us think for not making it too easy so that we can grow and transform into the image of Jesus. We know that's what you want. That's our destiny, really. So this morning, help us as we hear this story. I pray that you would move us and transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when we were in Israel this past year, we got a chance to go up on the Mount of Olives and it's a really beautiful place. This is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. But, but from this vantage point at the Mount of Olives, uh, you have a really good view uh, into the Eastern Gate. And you can kind of see this. Is a, this is a picture straight. Uh, it's from the Garden of Gethsemane. And you can see through the olive trees the Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate is blocked up right now. It's, it's, been, it's been, you know, bricked up, cemented over for, for you know, hundreds of years. Uh, but it's still there. I mean, I think prophecy says that the Messiah will return through the Eastern Gate. And, and so, you know, this is also probably the way that Jesus would have gone as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, and if, if you go down the Mount of Olives, you kind of come to the Kidron Valley. And what you'll see here is if you look, you'll see on the top right is the eastern gate. And you have to go through this little valley. And as you can see, there's a lot of switchbacks back and forth up to the actual gate itself. 
the trip that Jesus made in this triumphal entry wasn't just going to the gate, getting a donkey, getting on it, and going through. This trip probably took a little while. I'm not going to say it took an hour, but it wasn't just a quick little jaunt. Um, at this point in Mark chapter 11, which is where we're going to be, Jesus has about a week left before he is crucified. And he has this magnificently planned entry into Jerusalem that would serve to begin a week of difficulty, betrayal, eventually death. Now, the appearance of God's prophecy, of God's Messiah, has been a prophecy that they've been talking talking about, they've been hearing about, and they tell stories about it probably at home, over uh, Shabbat dinners, maybe they tell stories about it over Passover, but they hear and remember what Zechariah said. We've heard it this morning. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Re- Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. A lot of these people grew up with this burned in their mind from the frenzy of activity and the these praises that people were heaping on Jesus as he traveled down these narrow streets. It seems that the crowd had fallen in love with him. I mean, why wouldn't they, right? He was different. He was a rabbi. He wasn't just a mighty warrior. In fact, I don't think any of them had ever seen if he could handle a sword, but hey, he could handle the word. He could handle Torah. He was a rabbi who knew the scriptures backward and forward. He could do miracles. He could heal the sick. He could even raise the dead. He could feed thousands. What better kind of a leader would you want than someone who could feed armies, who could heal them when they've been wounded, and who could even raise them back from the dead? This Man changed the world. Israel at the top. And this was Passover when Jesus was making his entry. Passover. Every time people made their way to Jerusalem, every time they would come to a festival, there was this subtle undercurrent of, is this when the Messiah will come? It's always a hope. An expectation. Maybe the Messiah will show up now. Oh, it's Sukkot. Maybe the Messiah will show up at the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, it's Passover. Maybe the Messiah will show up now. Oh, it's Yom Kippur. Maybe the Messiah will show up now. Every time there was this underlying hope, maybe this was the Talash. And for Passover, it seemed too good to be true. So as Jesus makes this trip, I'm sure word was spreading and, and, you know, crowds were growing. Now, I don't know if this was planned. I don't know if the apostles kind of started making their way and started telling people. I don't know how it happened. Maybe it grew organically. Whatever the case, there was a crowd from the start of the journey. Mark 11, uh, verse 9 says this, Those that went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the, is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These people knew their scriptures. These were, these were songs that they would sing, stories that they were here. Uh, they were shouting the words from Psalm 118. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. Psalm 118 is a song of victory. Not only that we've won, but asking God to save us and in a way help us to win. So as Jesus rides in, I think some people were there just to catch a glimpse because they've heard about this person. They just wanted to catch just a little glimpse. Some came maybe in hopes that he would pay attention to them. Others came because they thought maybe the revolution was about to begin. Psalm 118 was a victory song. 
after all. And the word Hosanna during that time was this politically charged word. It wasn't just a nice little, as our child children say, Hosanna. This was a politically charged word. When you heard that, people got a little nervous. People were cheering this Messiah that they had been waiting for. And the only problem was, it seems they'd all been waiting for a slightly different Messiah. Even today, when we think of Jesus, who is it that comes to mind for you? Savior? Master? Rescuer? Healer? Buddy? Silent partner? Genie? I think our image of Jesus that we have in our mind might say a lot about what is it we're actually looking for. Jesus knew what most people were expecting. He knew the stories, too. When he decided to come to Jerusalem, I think he did so with a different kind of plan. Now, the typical grand entrance of a king would have looked much different, uh, kind of like that that uh, painting, a Ro- The Roman Triumph by by Paul Rubens, not Pee Wee Herman, the other Paul Rubens, the ancient, uh, the old artist. Um, you think this is what it should look like. You know, you've got, you've got attendants. You've got people that are carrying this great flames of victory. You have, you know, musicians and, and servants and animals and, and, you know, things that, that declare victory. Images of wealth and status. When we, when we even today see, see leaders show up with, with signs of their financial power or military might, we ooh and ah over them. Maybe not out loud, but inside we go, that's what I want. When we see a leader who exhibits this, inside we think, yep, that's, that's the American dream. That's what we want. It's what we expect of leaders today. And these people were no different. I think, I think Jesus planned an intentional reference to Zechariah 9.9. But that's about it. Because he didn't exude financial wealth. He didn't exude military might. The donkey he rode on wasn't a war horse. It was, wasn't even intimidating. It wasn't even his. He borrowed it. And had to return it. A king's grand entrance should have looked more triumphant. But Jesus had something else in mind here. And I think Jesus was making fun of the power structures of the day and usually what goes along with that power. This was a bit of street theater, I think. For those who were wanting a warrior, they saw a man on an animal that kings and princes rode on when they wanted to sue for peace. Many of those followers did not want to make peace. They wanted vengeance. For those people wanting strong and mighty leader, they saw a man sitting on a very young donkey that I, I, in my head, I just imagine it's probably a little too small to be ridden gracefully. Maybe even his feet were kind of dragging the ground a little bit. I think it all probably looked a little awkward. But for those who wanted to see a leader make a strong and powerful entrance, they got an exciting but an anticlimactic parade. Because in Mark, his story is a little different. This is what Mark says. Mark says, uh, I don't think I have it on there. Mark says, he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, It was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelfth. So he makes this grand entrance, goes into the temple, looks around, and then leaves. All these people coming to see something amazing. They see him just leave. Now for all the buildup, I wonder if there were those people in Mark's audience that saw this as a little bit of a letdown. 
but I think it's fantastic. This is intentional. You know, Jesus is brilliantly and unflinchingly showing everyone he's not going to be manipulated. He's letting everyone down equally, which is what I love to do. Annoy everyone at a rate that's normal for them, right? He's letting everybody down equally. He knows the hearts of men. It says uh, in one of the Gospels that talks about Jesus knew them. He knows the hearts of man, and he's not going to be swayed by that. He knows the hearts of men. He knows that we may mean well, but most of what we want is rooted in selfishness. Even still, how often do we try to persuade God to do this or that? How often do we do our best to sway him to our way of thinking? And maybe when we have unanswered prayers or situations that didn't quite go our way, how often have we found God to be kind of anticlimactic? How often have we gotten mad because, well, God wouldn't quite bend to our will? Are we that different from those people who sang their praises to him so long ago? Following him only to find that he is not taking us where we hoped he would take us. He's not taking us where we wanted to go, but somewhere else entirely. And he's taking a sweet time doing it. Were Jesus to have bent to the will of that crowd, the entire story may have changed. Among other things, they wanted war. They wanted vengeance. They wanted justice and victory. They wanted freedom and a place in God's coming kingdom. They wanted a future that was filled with the blessings that he had promised them. He wanted a future for their children and their children's children. They knew exactly what they wanted from their Messiah. What they got instead was a Messiah who wasn't interested in playing their games of power and control because he had bigger plans in mind. He still does. I mean, don't misunderstand. From the moment Jesus entered Jerusalem, he had already set in plan, uh, uh, set in a uh, plan in motion to grant justice. He had already set a plan in motion to grant victory. He had already set in pl- in motion this this plan to grant freedom because freedom was already at hand and the gates of eternity were about to be busted open wide once and for all. He was planning on this all along. But Jesus would prove to be a different kind of Messiah than they were expecting. For many in that group, even still, For many of us, even today, his way of love and submission and humility and peace, they're all good traits, but they aren't what we expect from a representative of the most powerful God. But what do we know about the all-powerful God, right? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not quite our thoughts. We're so wrapped up in what we think we want. Power, financial security, control, control over our government, over our communities, over our relationships. We think so much that we want control so much, we kind of think we deserve it. We kind of look at it as a right. And we're so wrapped up in finding happiness for ourselves. We think we know where happiness can be found. And we all pursue it so hard, so hard. Some of us pursue it even to the death. Along the way, we desperately reach and we claw for all of these things. And either intentionally or unintentionally, we hurt other people. We wound them. We cause scars. We break relationships. We blame. We push people away. We exclude and we reject all because we think that what we want is what we need. In truth, we need more than a political victory or better legislation. We need more than financial satisfaction, financial security. We need more than personal security. We need more than just another hit of pleasure. We need more than another show to binge. 
We need more than a better phone. We need forgiveness. We need forgiveness for our selfishness, for our lack of love for God and the people he has put in our life. This is what moved Jesus to keep going. He looked at us and he goes, man, you can't do it. He knew how deep sin had taken root, even in the best of us. And it was his desperate desire to forgive and to save that led him to and kept him on that cross. I mean, praise God that Jesus may never have been the Messiah people thought they wanted, but he was the Messiah God knew we needed. Amen. So this last week in Jesus's life was about to test a lot of people. A few short days after this parade of hopes and dreams, this this exciting spectacle, uh, um, Jesus stood before them, bloodied, badly beaten, seemed to be defeated. Was their compassion returned to Jesus? I mean, even when Pilate said, this man's innocent, how about we have a deal? I'll release somebody to you. Who did they choose? They chose a religious jihadist extremist. Someone who's a murderer who killed somebody. This wasn't just a a thief. Barabbas was a very bad man. Even the religious leaders chose him over an innocent man. And I think for those people in the crowd, they're thinking, wow, our religious leaders aren't even choosing this guy. Maybe he's not the Messiah after all. Perhaps this is just another fly-by-night pretender. And I wonder if even his disciples in their grief may have thought he was a letdown. Maybe we chose poorly. In chapter 15, Starting in verse 16, then the soldiers led him to the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, king of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed spat on him and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of his purple cloak, put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two rebels. They weren't just thieves. These were probably also political jihadists. Maybe the worst of the worst. One on his right, one on his left. Let's watch this. Mark 15, verse 37, then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Jesus had made it to the cross. But his journey wasn't quite complete. You know, Jesus' plan was never to condemn, not even Israel's enemies, was to forgive. It wasn't to smite the earth, but to offer hope. The plan wasn't to exclude, but it was to include all who would believe. The plan was always justice. Always victory. Always eternity. But his death wasn't the end. 
It was only the beginning. So I'll tell you, if you have been let down by God who didn't quite meet your expectations, why not let him show you what he has planned instead? If you've been let down by your own narrow-minded view of who God is, why not allow him to open your eyes so that you may also see? And for those of you, you who need forgiveness, I want you to know that the first chance he got to forgive somebody, the thief next to him, he did it. He wants to forgive you too. For those who need forgiveness, it's there. For those of you who need victory, it's there. For those of you who need a future, he is offering it. Today is the day to follow Jesus in faith, in baptism, and in to eternity. I don't want to spoil the ending for you, so come next week to see how this all turns out. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the story of Jesus. Lord, thank you for um, giving us people that we can journey alongside in our faith. And I pray that you'd help us today to be reminded of just how much love you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you have a need of prayer, we have men and women around the room. We would love to pray with you. Let's stand together.